At East Tennessee State University, simulation has become a fundamental part of the curriculum for both students and residents in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. We know that the primary purpose of medical education is to provide a foundation for sound patient care and clinical research. There is a national expectation that physicians be competent in both the application of knowledge and demonstration of clinical skills. Consistent with these goals, the Quillen College of Medicine has developed our Center for Experiential Learning, this center offers an environment where learning occurs in an exciting, active, dynamic area for faculty, resident, and student interaction. This video will demonstrate a typical simulation including the behind-the-scenes workings of our simulation lab and how our simulations are staged and produced. The layout of our simulation lab includes two rooms in which the simulations take place. These rooms are on either side of a preparatory and debriefing room with one-way glass mirrors where non-participants can observe the simulations as they're played out. Then the whole team can meet to debrief the simulation. Debriefing is an important part of the simulation experience, and we routinely review both what went right and what went wrong in a simulation and ensure that all learning objectives are fully appreciated. Also included in our lab layout are high-tech control rooms, again separated from the simulation rooms by one-way mirrors, where the behind-the-scenes operations take place. Here, the mannequins are voiced and the simulators are programmed to respond to the participants' interventions. For example, the patient's vital signs are programmed to respond appropriately to blood loss, fluid replacement, or medical interventions. Our lab consists of various low-fidelity and high-fidelity mannequins, as well as multiple task-specific trainers. The mannequins include five adults, two medis and three Lairdals, one child, one baby, and an OL birthing simulator. We have an innovative virtual laparoscopic surgery simulator as well, and task-specific trainers including central line placement, venous cannulation, lumbar puncture, and paracentesis simulation. Careful preparatory work goes into each stage simulation. Initially, a concept is brought forth and then a detailed script is written based on a template which specifies learning objectives, simulation overview, patient history, labs, simulation parameters, expected actions by participants, personnel and props needed, additional literature used for background research, ACGME core competencies addressed for resident training, debriefing goals, and the scenario author. Several hours of background work are needed to research and script each simulation. Often simulations involve teamwork from other departments, including the drama department who provide live acting and voice talent for the productions. We've also worked closely with the Department of Engineering to develop simulators in-house, such as our novel pelvic surgical simulator, where a void existed in the commercial market. To run a typical simulation requires several key personnel, including the simulation lab coordinator, as well as voice talent, to act as the patient. Some simulations require additional actors to fully staff a scenario, such as a patient's family member or friends, nursing, or other supporting healthcare roles. All of this is usually coordinated by faculty members representing both the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, as well as faculty from the Center for Experiential Learning. Monitors in the simulation room show real-time vital signs if participants ask to obtain them. Using other computer monitors in the room, we can provide scenario participants with a variety of rich media, for example, x-ray films, EKGs, photographs of various pathologies pulled off the internet, or more specifically for obstetric scenarios, fetal heart tracings from our website, ob-efm.com. In the following scenario, the residents are presented with a 22 weeks pregnant patient who is suffering pulmonary symptoms. The residents know nothing about the scenario before entering the simulation room and are given no hints beforehand about the simulation. They are told only that the setting is in the emergency department. She is an administrative assistant to the governor, visiting from out of town, and she has nonspecific symptoms including fever, dyspnea, cough, headache, chills, vomiting, and chest pain. Participants are not told about her recent exposure to a package containing a powdered substance unless they specifically elicit this information from her. Hi, Ms. Gordon. I'm Dr. Fall. This is Dr. Talbot. Hi, Dr. Hoberman, Dr. Smith, how are you feeling? Hi. I'm not feeling too good. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going on? I feel, I feel feverish and I, I can't catch my breath. I've got a little bit of a cough. When did all this start? Oh, it, it's kind of gotten worse over the past couple of days. Okay. How pregnant are you? 22 weeks. Okay. And have you been around anybody that has a cough? Feeling worse. Did we get contact okay, just, before we can you take a deep breath from me? After completing their initial history and physical exam, the residents work as a team to develop a differential diagnosis. The residents must request any relevant laboratory or imaging studies. The authors of the scenario have prepared appropriate results in anticipation of these requests beforehand. Here they're presented with additional supporting material for the scenario 
in this case a chest x-ray. The residents have learned that the goals for the successful completion of the scenario involve all aspects of the six core competencies. Patient care and medical knowledge are easily assessed in each situation. Practice-based learning and improvement is encouraged by allowing the residents to access evidence-based information sources during the scenario, and during the debriefing of the simulation, self and peer assessment is deliberately encouraged. Systems-based practice is encouraged by teaching the appropriate use of resources and having the learners work in interprofessional teams in the broader context of the patient care system. Professionalism is emphasized in many ways, teaching the learners compassion, integrity, sensitivity, responsiveness, and respect for the patient's privacy and autonomy. And finally, interpersonal skills and communication are at the core of each scenario as learners are assessed on their ability to function as a team. After developing an appropriate working diagnosis, the learners are required to implement certain predefined therapeutic management options for the patient before the scenario is completed. Why is that important? No doxy. No. No doxy. Yeah. Give Yeah. You are okay with Michael. I think you've achieved your learning objective. At the conclusion of the scenario, the learners are invited back into the debriefing room where the predefined learning objectives are emphasized and the learners are encouraged to assess their individual and team performance. It's important to always review both what went right and what went wrong in each simulation. So Patty works for the governor and uh, Patty once had a uh, upper respiratory, or she had an upper GI bug and she had to get an MRI of the admin for it and she's still paying that off because her insurance wasn't covered. So this is a very important person who got too much treatment who's now reluctant to tell you she works for the governor. And so had she not been uncomfortable with that, she might have told you information quick on. So what clued you off that it was anthrax? How did you all figure it out so quickly? She said she worked for the government, so I don't know what triggered that. But then, uh, yeah, and actually, you had to be very persistent to get that out of her. Yeah. Because she tried to be evasive. She's had a cough and then a rash, so I was thinking something with both findings of lungs and skin. Simulation has become an integral part in our resident and student education. The way we see it, practice makes perfect. If a learner makes a serious medical mistake, the patient's revived after a quick computer manipulation in the simulation lab. In real life, there is no room for error. This could mean the difference between life or death. We know that proper preparation and application of learned knowledge on simulated mannequins provides the essential skills and confidence needed to transfer to a real-world hospital setting.